one of our best teachers. Welcome, Sherry Schaefer. Thank you, Linda. For those of you that don't know me, as Linda said, um, my professional career was a as an art teacher in the public schools, primarily here in Carroll County. And as I was working, my first assignment actually was in Anne Arundel County, and one of my co-workers says, let's learn to make a basket. <laughs> okay, why not? And our first basket that we learned was in the style of the Appalachian egg basket. And that still really is my first love. I just, I have made them in all different sizes, and they use the rib construction. And so that's the title of my course for this this week at Common Ground is using not to be afraid of ribs, to be able to use them. And so most of the people in the class um, are making some type of a basket that started with a stick handle. And I had a basic frame and then they've been adding ribs and choosing their own colors and different materials to do that. But then we've, we've branched out as well, and we're a little bit smaller group than I've had in the past, but it works out quite well, I think, for the individuals because we're doing all kinds of things. Uh, we have a Josephine Knot hen basket being made. We've done a flat piece. We've done more sculptural pieces. So I really encourage you to come and look at the final results on Friday because you're gonna be surprised at just what's been, uh, what has been done. As far as what I have as an exhibit here on the wall, most of these pieces were done during the pandemic lockdown where you, you know, suddenly find yourself just, okay, now what? And I had to do something. And so I used supplies that I had, as well as the fact that I live um, outside of Westminster on a farm and we have some woods. And I'd be outside walking and seeing things, and I have a son-in-law who likes to do that as well. And he would find these really interesting wood sculpture, wood pieces, and bring them in and say, what do you want to do with this? And so that's how I got the wood for some of these pieces. You certainly just don't go out with the intention, I'm going to find a twist in the knot like this. It just, it's happenstance. You find it, and then I, all these pieces, the wood has been either in my barn or in my garage drying for at least a year, so they're not going to shrink and there's gets rid of any bugs. So they're safe in that. And I just look at them and think, okay, what can I do? And again, thinking about the nature and being outside and using techniques that I would use in a traditional basket, how can I do it in a more sculptural way that incorporates the wood pieces that I've found? And one of the things you learn as a basket maker is to be able to shape your basket. First, you just learn the basic premises of weaving, but then as you get better, you want sometimes them to come in, sometimes they flower out. So I'm using that same technique to create some of these pod-like shapes and then flat shapes. And many times they just take on a life of their own. Right now, during, while the students are working, I've got a little piece going that I just started and it's just evolving and I look at it for a while and I do a little bit more. So that's often how it occurs. Although I will say on this one, I was pretty sure before I began a general idea of the shape because the, the wood itself was twisted. So I knew I wanted to duplicate that kind of twist and turn and wrap around. And so I drilled holes into the ends of the wood, put my ribs in, and started weaving large parts, bring them in tight, expand again, narrow so it could go around, have these kind of undulating shapes, and just get this idea of this continuity that's going around and around. Working with colors that are all earthy, but also working with different flat reed, round reed, some seagrass, a variety of items. This one is kind of a variation of that, where I started on one end and I had this big pod, and then I thought, well, I just don't want to come back in. I've already done that. I need to do something different. So it came in the side and then kept this as a flat piece. So almost as though you're just weaving a flat side. And I incorporated some grasses, as well as 
I, I do all kinds of handicrafts, all artists do that. So I had some of this hairy yarn that I had done some knitting project with at some point, incorporated that, incorporated some beads. And again, just get that idea of the flow. And I like the idea that it just kind of has that real earthy feel of something could be growing, maybe a hornet's nest, perhaps. There's all kind of, I think, earthy images that you can pull up with that. One of the things that Carroll County Arts Council did during that time of lockdown, they were encouraging their artists to just keep creating. And so they would have thematic challenges. And one, and this is a result of one of those challenges. So I have made small wax linen containers. And one year for coming around, we taught this and everyone mm -hmm. made these little, but then again, I'm going with earthy colors and I thought they really look like pods. And in the fall, sometimes they're ready to pop open. How can I incorporate it? So I had a nice little twisty branch that I found and did some wrapping of repeating colors, but just made these individual little wax linen vessels, attached them. And then I did some of these that are really pod-like, like you would begin a basket, but then just pulled them off. So this was fun to do because it was taking techniques that I'd used before, but incorporating them in more of a sculptural look and then having some of the wax linen so it'd be hairy. So I just like doing that. The one in the center is a random weave, which in some ways you think, oh, well, that's easy because you're not following a pattern and anything goes. But that can somewhat be a barrier for some people. And, to, and what I have offered students is that as they finish these baskets, if time permits, they, I, they will be able to do a random weave hen, a little bit bigger than this. But when you don't have a specific pattern to follow, sometimes that's more difficult, but it's freeing if you just let yourself go. So it's a great chance to use up different materials and just keep weaving and when do you stop? So this one is, again, supposed to look earthy and kind of come up and have a lot of these little twisty vines that are put on flat. But I use round reed, flat reed, dyed reed, natural cane, different grasses to fill in to give that feeling. And then someone had given me some willow sticks. So I did these scoops. You'll see them from time to time if you um, do any searches online. And using up different materials, this actually are, these are palm leaves. Those of you um, in the spring, a lot of churches hand out palms and so you can weave with them as well. So, so most of this is a result of using what I have and thinking somewhat in earth tones. This one, just a simple, Reed, but then using reed and pods and pine cones, things I would find that would tie together. So you can see how if somebody evolved away from the practical, functional basket, but using the same techniques, the same materials to then make sculptural forms. Any questions? Sure. Thank you. Um, outside of the wood that we were using, uh, has there been anything in particular in terms of material that you gravitated more towards? You know, you mentioned grasses and a lot of these hobby yarns. It seems I, I do find myself, I've been studying and I've, and I've taken some classes with some uh, basket weavers who do go out and they'll get cattails, daylilies, which I happen to have a ton of, so I really feel like I need to be able to incorporate them as well. So. I'm, I see myself moving in that direction. And again, I think it just speaks to the idea of using what you have. Traditionally, that's what basket weavers do. You go to different locations of the country and you're gonna find them using different materials because of what is available to them in that specific location. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I've been teaching three years now on Zoom. Uh, first year was very exciting because I was a last minute fill-in for the instructor, so I hadn't had any input on the materials or the needles or anything, and you couldn't get to a store to buy anything. So we had some very interesting projects that year because everybody just like, knit with, knit with what you've got. So 
we, uh, every, we, one of our projects was a bookmark, but it was a knitted bookmark, so we were all satisfied. Um, this is a dishcloth. This is my dishcloth. Well, it's actually the granny dishcloth. You can find it anywhere. It's been knitted for probably centuries at this point. Um, but it's a dishcloth, and it's a zen thing for me. When I don't want to think about anything, I can knit a dishcloth. You put on the needles, and it's very calming, very settling, very centering. to just know what I'm doing, and my hands know what they're doing, so I don't really have to think about it a lot. It's a good thing. So sometimes if you don't have a lot, you make coasters. You can make all sorts of things. This is was done on bigger needles. It's, it's the same dishcloth, but with slightly bigger needles. Nothing too fancy here. Um, but luckily, I can usually convince the students, well, they, they've all learned to knit. Uh, you know, from three years now. Um, some of them, this year I had a returning knitter who hopefully will have something in the student show, even though we did the class first week because she's been working on it. She's seen Ellen Hurwitz with her pink and purple yarn. That's what she's working on and she's, you know, knitting mightily to try and get finished by the student show. And I keep finding, you need buttons? Okay, I'll bring buttons from my house. You need, <laughs> so I keep, keep keeping her supplied with what she needs to get this finished. So I'm, it would be very exciting to have something from my knitters in the, now, did I teach her to knit that pattern? No. Did I help her figure out what she needed to do to get that pattern? Yeah. But while everybody else was knitting dishcloths, Ellen was working away on her dress, and then she'd say, what's this do? And they're like, okay, let's look up the video. And then I'd work at it, and then it's like, oh, this is how it works. And then we then we do it together, and then she's off again, off again with her knitting, so. Um, you know, in terms of the concept of migration, which I think is one of our concepts this year, Knitting can go with you anywhere. This is knitting right here in my hand. I've been working on it all day. It's called an eye cord. I want to make a lanyard for my badge to go on. And it's called a, it's eye cord, which is short for idiot cord. So of course, um, I just managed to mess it up but now. So it's like I have to tear it out and try and figure out what I did because I wasn't paying attention. And so yeah, I, I can even mess up an idiot cord. So, um, but it's, I give my knitting away. I don't keep it. I give it to people. I usually do dishcloths. I'm limited in terms of the fibers I can work with because I have fiber sensitivity. So I work a lot with cottons. I can work with rayon. I can work with silk. You know, some things, but some things, anything with polyester in it just makes me go crazy. And um, I gotta be careful with wool. I love wool, but I've gotta be careful with it. So generally, dishcloths or things that are based on the dishcloth pattern. I once took a dishcloth pattern and started doing it in bright orange day glow yarn and just kept knitting and knitting and then it kind of turned into something and then I started crocheting and it turned into a sea slug, <laughs> which I gave to a kid at a Civil War reenactment because he liked it and he knew it was a sea slug. So it's like, here, this is yours, you have a sea slug. So I don't have a picture yeah, of it yeah, because yeah. we were out of the field. So. That's why yeah, come take knitting, you'll learn to knit. It'll, I'm very gentle. And, um, <laughs> We'll, we'll get through it together, so it's all good. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Yes, I'll speak louder. Well, luckily, no one knows what I'm saying anyway, so there's the beauty in that one. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, not much Kali and Schle, out Kat and Schle, uh, uh, um, yeah, so word vomit, mumbo jumbo, as, as I've been telling people. Um, yeah, so I'm Tyro Tapa. I am a sixth generation Dene Weaver. I'm from the Four Corners. Um, so, if, for um, anyone not familiar with that, it's where um, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona all intersect. And, you know, these are all arbitrary lines, but people ask, like, oh, are you, like, how Four Corners are you? Um, so, my family's on the Arizona side, and we're about, what? Four miles away from Utah, two from New Mexico, and um, about six or eight away from Colorado. So, pretty four corners. Um, beautiful part of the country. If you guys ever had a chance, I urge you guys to, to go out there, travel, see the things. It is high desert, which is a different part of the world. Um, imagine just being on one mountain, being able to see like upwards of 10 around you, but giant valleys with rivers and canyon systems all in between. Yeah, I get the lovely pleasure of coming from there and getting to share that with you guys. Um, in my little intro, I said good evening, I said my name, um, also the name kind of self-proclaimed at this point, um, I, in, in my own language, or my people's language, um, Navajo for context. Um, and so with that, I've kind of self-labeled myself as uh, the tall weeping man, which is you know, pretty explanatory in that sense. Um, also in the intro, I said my clans, which is a really important thing in terms of identity, placehood, um, relations, um, and all of these tie into what it is to be human. So with that, um, we are a matrilineal society. We inherit everything from our mother. Um, my new gender roles over colonization have influenced that. But um, in my words, I said I am, I am of the many goats clan. I inherited that from my mother. Um, I am born for, which is my father's clan, um, folded arms people. I, my mom's dad's clan um, is the, water, the water's edge people. Um, and then my dad's dad's clan is the Mexican people, which was adopted at some point later on. But anywho, um, I'm here teaching Sheik Tulum, um, Navajo style, which has been great fun. I've had a lot of time and experience. Um, I've been weaving since I was seven. Um, Kind of doing a lot of spinning, carding, a lot of the processing, um, just extra hands, pretty much. This is a family operation, slash um, past tense was. Um, most commonly in a lot of families out that way, it's um, not necessarily becoming a lost art, but in terms of profession and integrating and really paving and pushing forward for innovation, that's kind of becoming a little halted. Um, but it's fun to play with that. It's fun to be recognized. It's fun to come to these spaces and to share this and to have people see my magic. Sometimes I've, I feel like I've, I've been telling people that I've been a black sheep in two worlds for a really good chunk of time, that it feels affirming to put in the work, have it done, complete it. That's a, a success in and of itself, but for people to see like, whoa, this, this thing exists, who, who would have thought? Um, it's really affirming, and in terms of community, again, that's what it's about. Um, a lot of my work is based in expression, storytelling, and more documenting. Um, three really common traits that my people have really paved and um, done and flourished well with in terms of designing and adding, con consistently adding to. Um, so as I mentioned, I do everything sheep to loom, not only for the course, but also my work. Um, personally, my little hot take is that that's what separates me from my contemporaries, is, is that um, yes, people weave, and like I said, some people still weave for profession. Um, really difficult, as it is for any kind of art living, but take it a step further in the sense of I am really trying to revitalize and really bring back um, sheep as, as our life. We have a lot of philosophies based in it. You know, phrases saying, you know, sheep is life. Um, and how that ties into our identity and just life cycles. As I've come to realize and I've dipped my toe in, um, I consider myself a full-time sheep herder, mind you, aside from this week. Um, but normally I'm up on the mountain, a little uh, 
12 by 14 foot uh, cabin and it's been fun. I mean, like I said, it's a family operation. I have ties that I feel not a lot of people, let alone my, my peer group, um, being able to have that. And it's been really humbling. Um, I have really poor uh, little imaging. You know, we can tell we're a little low on the, um, it's called the projector thing. But just kind of get some scenes going. Um, so this is my family's corral. Um, classic, this is the thing that I see every morning. Um, at least back home, all I have to worry about is getting a cup of coffee, making sure they eat, making sure they come back, and watching the sunset. So, um, a good way of living. I do a lot of through hiking. Um, I like to be active. I, I'm young and able-bodied. I should flip that up and really cherish that. As I've come to realize with a lot of people in my life, you know, I have a, a friend group from the ages 8 to 98, and with that, there's a lot of life that's been lived and you know, gifts like that. So through that, I'm kind of just listening to um, clans, what that is, um, and kind of beginnings into this. This is young Tyrell, with my great-grandmother, um, Roy Katie's mom, slash our matriarch. Um, again, instances like this of feeding lambs in the morning, or just in the winter giving hay. Those small connections and those ties, life, again, as I've said, life being lived, I think that that's also another thing that sets apart, um, and is also frustrating to my work, is, is that it's so culturally Affiliated. You know, I, as you can tell, like to weave funky things, things that I think need to be woven and documented. But in terms of institutions that I commonly affiliate with, you're put in this little pigeonhole of how much you can leeway because you're going off of arbitrary um, uh, kind of standards that more often than not white people have in, in, enforced in Navajo aesthetics for, for weaving. So a lot of my work, is, I think, um, as you can tell, it kind of pushes beyond that and likes to play with that. Um, this is kind of where I am for, for um, locale. That's currently where I'm based. Um, this little dot is where my parents are based, right next to it. Um, I love being on the East Coast because uh, all the highways here are green tunnels. <laughs> and I love that people kind of talk about going up hills every day. Oh, man. I'm kind of with there with the humidity, but uh, in terms of elevation gain, yeah, I am more than okay with that. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is kind of like older images of what, like, this is what I think of when I think of my people. When I think of, you know, obviously it's, it's unfortunate that it's in black and white, and that's kind of how the imaging goes of past tense. But culture's not static. It shouldn't be static. It's fluid, dynamic, and amorphous. And every person, you know, everyone in this room in your own communities um, express that. Um, I just happen to come from something that's been established for remotely. Um, it not only is it intimate work, but it's interesting to not only know more about myself, but my family and my lineage through work. You know, I, I think that very often, especially in a career sense, we find that. Um, and it feels good. You know, um, these are our neighboring people, the Hopi. Um, more often than not, after colonization, gender roles were really adopted on our end. Um, mainly through indoctrination a lot, in a lot of situations like that. Um, anywho, there's this kind of stereotype of, oh, Pueblo men, they, they're the weavers, and the Navajo women, they're the weavers. Um, back in the day, skills were skills. You know, you should be able to provide yourself and do anything. Um, and people live like that. Um, unfortunate that a lot of people have adopted that. Um, so again, for context, where I'm coming from, as crazy as this may seem, and look, I'm not the, I'm not the, I am not the, or, the origin of all that. Um, the work has been um, paved by people like D.Y. Begay, Barbara Taylor Ornelius, Roy Cady, um, a lot of these veterans um, who affiliate with these institutions are well known, revered, but have also starved to, to get to where they are. You know, I'm very fortunate to not only have this in my bloodline, but to be working so intimately with a master class, you know, a master weaver. You know, how often do we run into a title like that? Um, and here's the generations, you know, my great grandma. I don't know who comes up with these generation labels, but apparently someone said that she's the third generation, he's the fourth, my aunt is the fifth, and myself being the sixth. Um, my aunt, aunt and uncle and I being the only ones in the family. Um, my aunt is more so like a hobby, like, yeah, I'll do commissions every now and then, but my grandfather and I being the predominant makers. Um, this is a little clip from Arizona Highways when we were now publishing beautiful images. Um, but they did a little story on us and a uh, kind of three-part series about our family and crafts, and that's fun. You know, images like this, like I said, home. This is my little cabin that I, I live up in, and 
endure all of the crazy storms. Your guys' little tornado yesterday kind of thing, my Bob? I think it was Nancy who yeah. released it. She's like, this is tornado weather. We're going to go downside. I was here I was in my little zen little room, just weaving away, and I was like, I feel way more safe in this big building than I do in this little dinky shack. Um, this was built um, maybe about 45 years ago for my great-great-grandparents. You know, this is kind of, as I said, family operation. This is their camp. And like I said, kind of going back to um, our corral, this is where I think home is. Um, when children are born, um, the parents keep the umbilical cord, um, keep it when it's dry, and then they bury it um, where the parents think that home is. So, at least mine slash, you know, a few other people in my family was buried in the sheep corral. So, in that sense, they say when you grow up, you always come back to where your home is. Um, so things like that. And this is also what sheep herding is. I can't tell, I can't see if you tell, but this is me in the outhouse while I'm also uh, sheep herding. Um, as well as weaving in the same way that my great grandma did in, in, in this little dinky cabin with an oil lamp and a headlamp and weaving away. This is one, one of the pieces that I was doing last year around this time. Also having to nanny and babysit little orphan lambs when we have them. Um, lovely, the biggest form of um, contraceptive I've ever had in my life. <laughs> um, imagine just an insistent four-legged thing that is able-bodied enough to follow you and complain all day. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, I love her. She unfortunately passed. This is my favorite lamb, little Becca. She passed in February, but because, you know, if it didn't happen with me, it would have happened with something else. But like I said, my, my day is being not really having to worry about anything but weaving sheep and watching the sunset and reading the evening. It's a bit surreal. I was telling people that it feels odd to, to come and share this space with people, but also think that last week this is my life. This is my reality. You know, I've kind of described it as non-verbal camp counseling. <laughs> Getting to know, like, this year we have 110 per head count when I left. Hopefully that's the same count we go back to. Um, but yeah, having to know all of them, having to take care of them, wanting to take care of them. Um, this is something that, like, again, goes back into debebe ina. We do everything for reciprocity, for a positive feedback loop that not only benefits them in terms of our livestock, but also takes care of us. Phrases like, take care of your sheep and they'll take care of you, or weave and you'll never go hungry. You know, this is the mentality that I was raised in, and I like to share that with people. Um, but yeah, show and tell. Um, like I said, a, a lot of my work is based in and hand production and really mastering that. So prior to getting my wheel, which I spin with most days because it's fast and the amount of weaving I do, whew, I need a lot of yarn. Um, but this is normally uh, what it is, uh, uh, Navajo lap spindle, renowned in the world. Um, one of the only spindles, if not, you, someone get, you know, fact check me on this, but I believe it's the only uh, spindle in the world that actually makes connection with the ground while also being maneuvered by the body. Um, there's also other types of supported spindles, but they're usually tiny and they go in like a little bowl. But yeah, fun. Um, and our cosmology also alludes to that. But I think that's something that's always fun about this medium too, is since it's so culturally affiliated, you know, my people didn't have a written language to talk about things and document things. Um, life was meant to be, life, our stories and all of that were meant to be intertwined. You know, a life that's lived is, 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 the, is the best lesson that you can get. Um, so I, that's, I, in my hot take, the, the reason why we never really needed, you know, needed to write things down, because people were living that way. And nowadays, when we talk about a lot of these communities being affected by where they're losing things, it's because people aren't living in the way that they have been. Um, it makes sense that you're not going to be carrying information that you don't use. Um, so, so yeah. Um, and I have the show and tell, as I've said many times. So in this little basket I'm going to pass around, these are all little vegetable dye. Um, that's my main thing too, along with um, hand spinning production, is I primarily only do vegetable dyes. Um, kind of inherited that via Roy, but um, really difficult, fun. I really like it. It makes me feel liberated in the sense of I like color. Um, with natural dyes, I think that it's amazing that um, you can just throw whatever color on that you need to, and it can be, you know, whatever. but uh, because they're naturally derived, they don't fight. If you use synthetic dyes, it's like, oh, that's, that's a lot of red. Pump, you know, push the brakes kind of thing. And I think that that's another added thing is I, with my productions, you can tell they're highly personalized, but also I 
being able to produce everything by hand is not only being endangered, but um, control, no. <laughs> a bit of a control freak in that sense, but that, I mean, once you get a taste of it, it's like a drug. You don't want anything less because you know what the standard is. Um, and coming from a family line, you have standards to, to go by. Um, so this is also in here, this is a, a sampler that Roy is. Um, I haven't really explained my formal relationship with Roy. Um, my whole life he's kind of been just tucked away in the corner, like, oh, that's your, your single gay Che. He's the one, who, your grand, Che means grandfather. So he's the, he's the guy who you're like, yeah, yeah. Never did I ever hear about this man's magic or what he can pull out of the butt, and I'm forever impressed with that man. Um, and uh, maybe about three, four years ago, I made the formal um, move to take an apprenticeship under him. You know, once my career really started to take off, I really wanted to see where this refinement can go. Um, and along with that, I've been learning a lot of, again, the family trades and the little small things. I think with this type of mastery, it's all the subtleties that actually make the difference and make the trained eye, you know, what it is. Um, so this has been one of the bigger ventures that I've taken. Um, so a lot of these bigger designs, um, this has a name of Dalvasit So this is uh, the male lightning. Um, this is pretty commonly known in at least my part of the res, and you know, classic in terms of Navajo weavings, the classic you know, geometric design. Also pass that around. Um, and so the fancy thing about this, and going into the family bloodline stuff, is this is Dolgasi Yeja. This is the smaller version, the female of lightning. Um, this being still continually used um, contemporarily, um, to the best of our knowledge, my grandfather and I are the only known people who know how to do this specific design. Um, and the one thing that sets it apart is, as you guys can look around, each one of these individual points has another name of Tsiri Bada, meaning the bird's bill. So each one, each one of these little points makes a little bird. Um, and so this was Roy's first attempt. My grandmother started this on this side to get the count. This was his sampler that he, he you know, she start, started him off right here, and this is his learning piece. Um, this was my learning piece into this design, you know, integrating it into the border. And, I've been weaving for a good amount of time, and this is the hardest thing I've ever done. This is a cute little, it's actually about the same size, yeah, it's just maybe a little bit bigger, but gosh, I, like, she had these little samplers that she used to keep track of counts and things like that, you know, she didn't write or read in English, so go figure, she's as genius enough to make little looms, actual physical things you can reference, and I remember studying that thing for like, ooh, like, uh, for sure, for sure, more than a solid week, and that's you know, like, you know, actual eight-hour days looking at this thing, picking it through, trying to get the system in flow. You know, mind you now that I, I have it in my head, it's, it's, it's there. This is my kind of first larger application into it. You know, these, as lovely as these photos are, they don't really do my work justice. Um, so this is why where I kind of scrape together last-minute things. Like this weaving today, it was my day project, so I started that this morning, and I didn't have anything physical to show, so people need to be able to see something. Um, yes, so like again, family, placehood, um, connection, self-identity. I mean, all things that people experience and get to look at in their life, but, you know, getting to learn that through the masters and having a direct tie to the masters. Um, even beautiful things like this, you know, this is a saddle blanket um, woven, I guess, somewhere in 85. My great-grandma wove this one. Um, this was her kind of count. Um, this is a bird's eye twill. Um, a little different than the type of work that we're doing in class. Um, and really sturdy. This is what clothes are made out of back in the day, historically, you know, um, and still are made. Um, really sturdy, I love it, gorgeous. Um, and even stuff like this, they last lifetimes and millennia. This, um, I'm pretty sure no one can really guess this aside from my students who have shared this with, but uh, this bag was woven in either 63 or 62 by my great great grandmother. Um, it's done with synthetic yarn, but she used the same yarn to weave the belt. She just respun it tighter, and you know, this is again. I, I now that I'm kind of getting a little more serious in my work, I've been working. Um, I guess I never really talked about my professional background. You know, I went to school for. I got my undergrad in forestry at Northern Arizona with a spec um, specified degree in um, civil culture and forest ecology. Or forest ecology plant nerd, so kind of always looking towards that. But um, in terms of this being my career now, I've done a lot of museum work, primarily archival work with a lot of different institutions like the Herd Museum, the Met, um, and kind of bouncing around with these larger names who have like really, really large collections, huge collections of Navajo textiles. And 
normally it's like artist kind of interpretations, specifically Navajo weavers, you know, coming in and kind of assessing the textiles. Um, classes like this, as well as more often than not, um, fortunately this summer I'm very, very booked out. So um, I've had, uh, formally now, uh, I just got an email yesterday of another exhibition later this month. Um, no, later, in the beginning of next month. So I have about currently uh, six installations across the country going on right now. Mind you, they're all smaller group shows, but big enough to have my name out and to have the work done. So I'm very fortunate, very blessed, and it's kind of crazy to think that this is, the fact that I'm here is technically not supposed to happen. Over the course of colonization of this continent, um, this lifeway is supposed to be eradicated. It's mm -hmm. supposed to not be functional, and it's not supposed to be applicable to the modern day. Um, and in some instances, in working with these institutions and spaces, I definitely feel that, that um, pushback. Um, but overall, I think the beauty about, again, work that you're living is, I'm gonna be doing this regardless if I get a paycheck or not. I, at the end of the day, I know I'm gonna be dying with a flock of sheep and knowing that I'm gonna weave until I physically can. Um, in the same way that my great-grandmother did and my family did, um, are doing, you know? I think that, that that's, we get really fascinated, especially with um, native peoples and indigenous peoples in this continent of the past tense. Um, you know, I, for a while with Roy, we didn't really know, at least in the family, of like who was going to pick it up because I mentioned you know, a single man most of it, all his life that you know there's no physical heir um, of what this kind of looks like. So we kind of were just marinating and being learning to be content with this going away, specifically the sheep. Um, and now that I am the new torch carrier in the family, I kind of feel that weight, but also um, liberated. I know that I personally don't plan to, you know, procreate in this lifetime, but I know that the conversation goes more towards, again, the lifestyle. People still have sheep. The bebe nina, sheep is life. You know, take care of them and they'll take care of you. Um, yeah, it's Daryl Tapa. <laughs> No rush in the show and tell. Uh, they can make their way whenever they do. Just toss them in this can corner. Can you raise the same sheep that Roy did? For the yeah, Navajo Churro is their main thing. Um, Navajo Churro is the first domesticated sheep breed brought to the Americas. We've ever had. We've had them ever since contact with the Spanish. Um, we also raise Navajo Angora goats, um, which is a type of mohair. And yeah, it's primarily a family operation. We've owned alpacas and llamas in the past, but currently our flock now. Yeah. How, how does a, like intuition? I think it's all, I mean, I, I, if you guys have seen me walking around campus, I normally have been wearing pants and I'm usually covered in spider webs. Um, so kind of alluding to that, everything's in some sense part of this cosmic mess. Um, uh, the idea of the soul knows what it wants. I remember writing, you know, the classic time capsule for when you graduate high school thing and maybe I was in first grade or something. I said I wanted to be an artist, all the cookie cutter questions. And, from that point, I was like, oh, I'm gonna be a doctor, I'm gonna be, that. Oh, I'm gonna be a forester. Um, all of that just really go out of the window. Um, and all of that just because I followed what I wanted. I followed what I knew I already had that affirmation in and what already gave me that embrace of, of comfort for at least to expand. And I mean, ever since then, it's been doors opening upon doors. And if there's, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, that's the intuition aspect of that. <laughs> Hasn't done me wrong yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, any other questions? The humans around? Beautiful. Um, yeah, uh, as we close this off, I have a lot of other words to say. <laughs> so, they're beautifully slapped on here with good old masking tape. Um, I advise taking a gander, especially with understanding why I weave the way that I do. So, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.
question was, how are you today in Gullah? Gullah is a combination of African and English words. When the enslaved people were brought to this country, this was the type of basketry, sweetgrass basket, is the type of basketry that they brought with them. When they came to this country, they couldn't find the grass that they had in Africa. So the grass that they found to use was sweet grass. And this is sweet grass. And when they found something, the, the grass to use, then they needed something to bind it with. What they normally used was palmetto from the palmetto trees. And what I normally did was cut it into strips to use. But since the pandemic, um, by the way, I don't harvest my own sweet grass. That's hard working. I'm not up for working hard. <laughs> so I started using caning. And this is caning. And the caning resembles the type of material they used to use long, long time ago. So I figured if they could use it, I could use it. And I like it because it makes a sturdy basket and I can get several different types of designs from it. So that's why I'm using caning now instead of uh, the palmetto. This is the tool that we use. The tool is a spoon or a fork with the end cut off and filed out. And the nail mold is used to put a path in the sweet grass so we can sew, not weave, our uh, baskets. Because when we're sewing baskets, the caning, this is like a needle and thread. So what we're doing, we're sewing the two of the rows together. So we're sewing, it's like using a piece of fabric with a needle and thread and showing the two pieces of fabric together. Well, I'm sewing the rows of sweet grass together with the cane. And this particular one is an agate that I found in my box the other day. So I decided, I couldn't decide whether I was going to make a necklace or a basket. So I think I'm going to make a basket with this one. What it's going to end up like, I have no idea. I don't know yet. It's just my hands will tell me when it's time to start going up or change direction. I have no idea. But what we did today in class, well, first of all, there are other things to sweet grass baskets. I mean, we say sweet grass baskets, but they are other things. There's jewelry, like my bracelet, my necklace, which is a combination of my work and Linda's work. Um, and we can do um, bracelets. And this one, my bracelet, well, I'm sorry, pass that around. And you can pass the sweet grass around so they can look at it. This one is a combination of um, indigo dye and my sweet grass. I wanted to see what it would be like or what it would look like to combine things. So now I'm thinking out of the box. I don't just do the sweet grass with the, um, this particular color. I'm trying things. So there's a combination of two, two different art forms. That's a different combination. Then this is a combination I also tried a basket to see what it looked, would look like. So that's another combination. So I'm always trying different things. So you don't necessarily have to do the same thing over and over again. You know, makes it a little different. You may <laughs> people say, well, I've seen, because I see people all the time when I go to events. Oh, I've got one like that. i got one like that. So I want to make something different. So you, you don't have one that's been dyed with indigo. So that's something different. They don't have a choker with Linda Hart's design and my sweet and my pine needles. So they don't have that. So this is something different. I'm combining different elements into my basket maybe. So this is another one here with an agate in the middle that's been complete. So I've got several things in this one. I started with the agate. I started with pine needles, I've got sweet grass, and I ended on the top with bulrush. And who knows what bulrush is? It's Somebody in there knows what bulrush is. I hear you. Did they put Moses in the bulrush? Moses was the person that was put in the river in a bulrush basket. You're absolutely correct. And bulrush is a, is a 
coarse of material. It's not as fine as the sweet grass. And by the way, sweet grass is fast becoming a dying art because of low country development. People who harvest sweet grass, for years they could go out and harvest their own sweet grass. But lately, the developments have bought up a lot of property that was just there. And now that they own the property, they don't want to allow other people to go on their property and harvest the sweet grass. They have to have permits and wait for when they can say, okay, you can come and harvest the sweet grass. So it's kind of dying out, you know, that there are several people, well, a lot of people in the low country, which is where I'm from, the low country in Georgetown, South Carolina. So it's hard for them to get sweet grass baskets because it's dying out. Another reason why it's dying out, young people don't have the patience. All they do is exercise their fingers. I can't do that. And the older people are getting much older and their hands are getting weak and they're just getting tired and not doing anymore. So if we don't, not careful, sweet grass basketry is going to become a dying art. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try my best to let it not become a dying art. So there's several points here that I made. I'm thinking out of the basket now with different things. This is a facial tissue holder. I had never seen one, but so I wanted to do something different. So they couldn't say, I got one of those. So I made my own. So be careful, put your hands on the box, because there's a box of tissue in there. So I just kind of put sweet grass, pine down bulrush. What I did, I, I began it with pine needles, sweet grass, and bulrush on the bottom. I even put my palmetto on it for South Carolina. So they don't know where that basket came from, South Carolina. <laughs> How long, how long does it take to make that? Sometimes I don't pay attention to how long it takes me. I just work. I have the TV on for some noise. Every now and then I look up and like somebody said, they don't even pay attention to what they're doing. I just work. You know, I don't have to look sometimes, but I guess my hand just like over 30 years I've been doing this, I guess my hand just knows where to go. So. I don't really, I don't keep time when I make things. I know it's, a, you know, it's approximately this time of that. And I've got bulrush in it. Bulrush is harder to work with than the sweet grass. The sweet grass is a little more flexible than the bulrush. Um, men usually make the, used to make the bulrush baskets that were used out in the fields to harvest the crop. And women made the baskets that were used on the inside for sewing baskets and the whole bread and other things. And this is one of the ones, of course, that they use for a sewing basket. So this is what they use. And it, it opens up, it opens up. So this is what they use, the women would make. But now they, there are a lot of men making baskets. In my class this week, I have three young men in my class making baskets. And to me, that was kind of a joy for me because very seldom I have men in there working and making baskets. So I was thrilled to that. The other thing I've done, this is a board. Anybody know what a, you all probably know what a board is. So what I did, cut the top off, clean all of the gunk out of the inside, put pine needles on the top, so wax linen, and I kind of just put some, stab some paint on it. So this is a different look as well. And the other different look with a board is this one. This one I put fabric on and pine needles on the top. So I'm just kind of thinking out of the basket. And I'm thinking out of the basket, thinking out of the box making oh, different things. <laughs> so you want to take a look at you know, that particular board. And the other thing I was thinking about, you know, something small, somebody might want to get something small to, to take or send to somebody or travel back home with that they can stick in their suitcase. They can do a picture frame. 
If you've got a special picture that you want to put in a frame, this will be the ideal thing. It doesn't cost an awful lot. What I have to do is grind the side of the picture frame down and then put my picture in so they can see all the see who put who made their basket. They can even put your picture on top of mine, I don't mind. <laughs> It can be washed. You can put it in the sink with some dish detergent. You can wash it with a soft brush and rinse it real good. You can either put it in the sun to dry or you can dry it with a hair dryer. But don't let it sit in the water because it'll rot. Because I've had people ask me to repair baskets that they've had a plant sitting in with the bottom rotted right out. I couldn't repair it. The only thing I could do was make a, another piece to just sit in the bottom. And next time, put a piece of plastic in there if you're going to put a plant in there. Because it'll rot your work from the inside out, not the outside in. Okay. And one more I want to show you. Well, no, two more. This particular one, larger ones are like this, of bread baskets. And I like the handles on it. Sometimes I make them without the handles, but I've got three different things in here also. I start with pine needles, I use sweet grass, and I use bulrush. And then I decided, because later on, when I began this one, I had no idea what I was going to be making. Didn't know how big the bottom was going to be. So I usually just start working, and whatever comes to mind, that's what I do. And I talked about jewelry. This is one. I took a, a class when, when we first started on Zoom. Everything had to be virtual. And I did a funky junky um, virtual, and I thought it was, was neat. They talked about all kinds of things. And one of the things that I found out or tried was they used a lot of jewel beads. Because, you know, I could put something on the bottom of that bead. So I decided to put um, this one particular one is with pine needles and so you can do you can do just about anything with baskets except shoes the kids always ask me when i went to school for pregnancy can you make some shoes no i cannot make any shoes <laughs> so um that just said i didn't have much time i said maybe i'll tell a story so i'll tell you a story i'll tell you one story Okay, this particular story is called, um, what's it called? <laughs> okay, anyway, it's called Chicken Dinner Money. Okay. Well, I know the big meat time is coming, so I talked to myself. First thing this morning when I get up, I said, Hey, Sue, you hate yourself when you go to the shop meet me here? I said, Mm hmm. But I'm walking on down the street and I can just feel old Satan right there beside me. I said, get deep behind me now. You're not going to be in the church. So I walk on down the road. I get to the church door and old Satan him and so right there beside me. I said, you must get outside the church. church huh? You must not go inside the church, church with me. And so I go inside the church. Old Rev him and preach a mighty fine son. Happy to shut all over the place. Well, I walk on in and I sit down, and you know when them old backers treat you, get ready for mess up. You read back like this, shot and pull out the act. And you know what I get ready for do? You know, get ready for mess up. Well, read, read back like this, shot and pull up him and, and him say, me and the deacon boy decide what to do with the chicken to the mother. So I said, well, you said. So I leans over to my sister. I said, Sister, is you never read you any? I 
Ain't none of us in that brush to go out there. <laughs> <laughs> 